do you know how SGLT2 inhibitors actually work? If not, stick around because that's what we're going to be covering in today's video. Hello Dr. Humans, welcome back to the channel. My name is Christine Barker, I'm a nephrologist and a medical educator and today we you and me are gonna conquer SGLT2 inhibitors like it's the easiest thing we've ever done. And it's a really great thing to cover because this is something that will make its way into your exams, but not just that, it will make its way into doctor life. SGLT2 inhibitors have exploded onto the scene in the last decade. They are all the rage and it's just, it is certain, right? We're gonna pay taxes and you're gonna see SGLT2 inhibitors in your exam. It's just how the world works at the moment. And we're going to break this into a couple of parts. First of all, tubular glomerular feedback. Stay with me. I'm going to make it super fun, super easy. You're going to love it. And then we're going to superimpose more of those clinical aspects and how this actually ties into helping in a myriad of conditions, not just diabetic kidney disease, but proteinuric CKD, also heart failure as well. So we'll be stacking all of that on. I can't wait. And before we get into today's tutorial, I wanted to let you know that what we are covering today is just a very small portion of the Diabetic Kidney Masterclass over on the website inside the Reno for the Written program. So if you are studying for exams, be sure to check that out. And of course, whilst you're there, be sure to check out the seven day kickstart challenge, which is absolutely free. And will give you everything you need to know on glomerulonephritis and immunology for your exams. It's my gift to you. It's a cheat code for those two things. Go get it. Okay, without further ado, let's jump into SGLT2 inhibitors. Okay, so first things first, tubuloglomerular feedback. So I want you to imagine that at birth, your nephrons have been given an actual mission, right? And that mission is to conserve sodium at all costs, right? Sodium is precious. And the reason sodium is precious is because we use sodium to move water around, okay? So sodium is very important because water is obviously important. So sodium is precious. You must conserve sodium at all costs. This is what your nephrons are told at birth. And what this means is that you're going to reabsorb 99 to 99.5% of all of the filtered sodium. Of all the sodium that enters your little tubules, you're going to reabsorb the vast majority of that, right? That's the goal. And then the nephron is told that you're going to work as a team, right? The proximal nephron and the distal nephron, you are a team. You work together, okay? When someone is struggling, someone else picks up the load, right? We're going to do this together. And then we have Mac or macula densa and his job is to control the workload between the two compartments. Sort of suss out what's happening, make sure nobody gets burnt out, make sure everyone can turn up to work and do their thing so that we can absorb sodium forever to the absolute max. That's the goal. And that is the mission that your nephrons are given at birth and basically they must succeed or the human will perish of dehydration. <laughs> it's very serious business. <laughs> so let's get into this in more detail. I'm just going to zoom in on this little nephron. We've got the proximal tubule, the distal tubule, we've got the loop of Henle, connecting duct, and of course the glomerulus here. The thing that I really want to draw your attention to right now is something known as the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Now this is a mysterious little bit of the kidney but I'm going to tell you it's the easiest thing ever when someone shows it to you. So it's basically these three things here. The afferent arteriovascular smooth muscle, extra glomerular mesangium we see here, and also MAC, macula densa. And MAC or macula densa is really just specialized tubule cells. Too easy. So the juxtaglomerular apparatus is those three things. And just zooming in on this a little bit further, in terms of the afferent arteriole, this has got a couple of components to it. So it's obviously got the smooth muscle and it can dilate and contract in response to various stimuli, but it's also got renin secreting cells. So this is where renin comes from, basically, the afferent arteriole. And down here, we have MAC or macula densa, an absolute champ. And we said before that MAC's job in all of this is really just to monitor the workload between the two compartments, between the proximal tubule and between the distal nephron as well. So what MAC's really gonna be doing is a specialized tubular cell. He's gonna be looking at the amount of sodium inside the tubular lumen here in the distal nephron, right? That's, that's what MAC is asking, that's the question. 
And the way he actually does this is he has a little NKCC2 sodium chloride co-transporter, which is the same type of transporter that we see in the loop of Henley, same deal. He's going to use that to sample the sodium and decide how much sodium is there inside those tubular cells. And he's going to use this sodium here to give him an idea of how things are going at all the different parts of the nephron. So if there is too much sodium here, he's going to get the distinct impression that the proximal tubule is struggling, right? Oh my goodness, like that's a bad thing, right? So if that's the case, then we're going to have to slow things down. And if the sodium is low here, he's going to get the distinct impression that the proximal tubule is thriving at life, is doing very, very well. And so we need to give it more work to do. So Mac is kind of in charge of all that. And you can see here that Mac's got his hand up towards this little tap here, right? Mac is in control of this tap. And so depending on how much sodium he sees here, he is going to either open the tap or close the tap, depending on what's happening inside the nephron. But what happens when this, this tap is opened or closed, right? This tap has a couple of components. It's got the afferent arterial constriction or dilation, and it has renin or lack thereof, reduced renin. So increased renin, reduced renin. And if we think about it, when we secrete renin, we will eventually have more angiotensin 2 running around and also aldosterone. And suddenly this makes sense, right? So Mac and his ability to control this tap is basically tubular glomerular feedback. That is what is happening here, okay? So now we're gonna have a look at this and see how this applies on this diagram. Those two scenarios, again, we said if the sodium was low, what's Mac going to do? Mac is going to think that the proximal tubule is finding it too easy. Everything's just too easy. And so if that's the case, he's going to do what? He's going to open the tap and allow more in, give the proximal tubule more to do, right? And what that means in reality is that the afferent arterial is going to dilate, letting more blood into the glomerulus. And at the same time, the efferent arterial is going to constrict, allowing less blood out of the glomerulus, right? Which means that we'll have this increased GFR, right? Increased glomerular filtration pressure. And why is this efferent arterial constricting? The reason is because when you open the tap, you release renin, and renin makes angiotensin 2. So this is because of angiotensin 2. And on the other hand, if the sodium was high here in the distal tubule, Mac's going to be like, whoa, proximal tubule is struggling. What are we going to do if the proximal tubule is struggling? We're going to close the tap because we want the proximal tubule to be able to reabsorb as much sodium as possible. The distal tubule can only do so much. So that would be a disaster, right? We must close the tap. And what does closing the tap mean? Closing the tap means we're going to constrict the afferent arterial, right? So there's going to be sort of less blood getting in here and we're going to dilate the efferent arterial so more blood leaves, okay? So that closing the tap is actually going to reduce the GFR. So that is tubuloglomerular feedback and I think what's really key here is to understand that Mac is just looking at a small little box right in front of him. Mac is not looking at the whole body sodium stores or anything more complicated, right? He's just looking at that sodium level in front of him and making decisions based on that. So that was tubuloglomerular feedback. Let's see how this causes problems in diabetic kidney disease. This will blow your mind. We're going to start here with hyperglycemia. I think we can all agree that that is the key problem here. That's the starting point. So we have hyperglycemia and what that means in terms of inside the little nephron is that we have lots of glucose coming in here into the proximal tubule. And here inside the proximal tubule we have SGLT2 transporters, right? This is sodium glucose co-transporters. So they're going to transport glucose at the same time as they transport sodium, right? That's just what they do. So they're going to take more of that sodium from the lumen every time they take up glucose. 
But what happens in diabetes is if there's a lot of sugar there in the proximal tubule to be reabsorbed, proximal tubule hypertrophies and actually increases the SGLT2 transporters in order to compensate for this increased glucose. So now we have even more of these little SGLT2 transporters. Now what's going to happen there is because now we're reabsorbing more glucose in the proximal tubule, we're going to find that we're absorbing more sodium here. And so what's going to happen is that by the time the urine gets to MAC, there's going to be less sodium, right? Less sodium here because of all that glucose absorption. The plot thickens, right? So now MAC is going to see, wait a minute, there's low sodium. The proximal tubule mustn't be working hard enough, right? Oh dear, we better give it something to do. What's Mac going to do? He's going to open the tap to give the proximal tubule more to do, even though in reality it's already doing quite a lot, right? He's going to open this tap and then what's going to happen? Let's follow it down here. What's going to happen then is we're going to have dilation of the afferent arterial more blood is going to come in, constriction of the effing arterial under the influence of angiotensin 2. And what's going to happen? We're going to have increased GFR. And that is how hyperglycemia leads to something called hyperfiltration. Oh my goodness, have you heard of that before? So that is a key starting point of diabetic nephropathy, hyperfiltration. But of course, the sugar itself is also toxic to the nephron because a lot of the renal tissue doesn't rely on insulin-dependent transport. If you have high sugar in your blood, you're going to have high sugar in your kidney cells. Aside from podocytes, most of the other tissue, basically the glucose is going to be in and around the cells. And the metabolism of that glucose causes reactive oxygen species and toxicity. And of course, you can get those glycation products, all the things. And that is going to culminate in damage to the glomerulus. Basically, that's the game. There's hyperfiltration, so extra pressure into that nephron, which can cause damage. Then we've got the sugar toxicity to the kidney itself, all of those things, right? So we're setting the scene for diabetic kidneys being under a lot of stress, under a lot of pressure, right? There's a lot going on, hyperfiltrating, hyperglycemia, all the things. With that, let's see how adding an SGLT2 inhibitor in here changes the game. Okay, this is a thing of magic. We're gonna see how all of this works on this diagram right here. First of all, zooming into this little proximal tubule. Now we said this proximal tubule is working quite hard. Remember, it's got all that hypertrophy going on. It's got a lot of those little transporters. I'm gonna put here hypertrophy and hard work, okay? And the reason that it's working hard is because it is just chugging along, absorbing the glucose, absorbing the glucose, absorbing the sodium, oh, it's just, it's got a lot to do. All of a sudden we come along and we prescribe an SGLT2 inhibitor. Suddenly, the proximal tubule's like, oh, I can relax. How good is that, right? So suddenly, we've given the proximal tubule a bit of a tea break. So after giving the proximal tubule a bit of a tea break, we can see that we're gonna reduce the proximal tubule energy expenditure, and that might actually help with CKD progression, of course, but also reduce the risk of acute kidney injury, which has been shown in meta-analysis as well. That's just one element here. If we block the SGLT2 transporter, now what's going to happen? This is good. This is so good. Okay, so now what's going to happen is we're going to absorb less glucose and less sodium here. So if we follow down this little nephron, we're going to have increased glucose and increased sodium here in the distal nephron. The plot thickens, right? So now we have increased sodium that Mac can see. And Max, like, ah, oh, there's a lot of sodium here. It's probably not great. That probably means the proximal tubule is actually struggling. And so we need to fix this. And what does he do when he thinks the proximal tubule is struggling? He will close the tap. Perfect. He's going to close the tap. We're going to constrict the afferent arterial so less blood is getting in. We're going to open the afferent arterial because there's less running around. And all the blood's going to leave. And so now we've reduced the GFR. So now we have reduced hyperfiltration. It is an actual thing of beauty. How amazing. Okay, so we're going to reduce hyperfiltration that way. Too good. 
And so we can see another way that by this tubular glomerular feedback, we're going to be reducing this glomerular pressure in the GFR, reducing proteinuria, and therefore we're going to be slowing the CKD progression. Incredible. But we're not finished yet because there's more. There's so much more. Now we've got increased glucose, so glycosuria, and increased sodium in the urine. So that's natriuresis, just sodium in the urine. And that is going to give us the rest of our mechanism of action. Starting with the glycosuria, the sugar in the urine, this is going to have a few downstream effects. So because we're losing more sugar molecules, we're going to need less insulin. And because of that, because there's less insulin, there's going to be breakdown of fat, right? Because when insulin is around, it chucks sugar into the cells and it promotes fat storage. So less insulin, we're going to be calling on our energy stores rather than building them up. So now we've got lipolysis fat breakdown. How good's that? And that is going to cause some weight loss. Typically 1.5 to 2 kilograms of weight loss in someone who's on an SGLT2 inhibitor. And because of fat breakdown, we have beta oxidation in the liver and that makes ketones. So now we can see why there's that risk of ketoacidosis when we use SGLT2 inhibitors. Here we're just talking about the mechanism of action, but be aware that you must stop these drugs three days before surgery, colonoscopy or some kind of religious fasting and if someone's sick they have to withhold it to avoid said issue. The other thing um, in the literature that can come up here is this beta oxidation and ketogenesis. There might be an antioxidant anti-inflammatory property to this and that's a source of research which might also help with CKD. But also just zooming in here with this loss of sugar in the urine, that's also going to help to lower our blood sugar as well. And in general, we'll have 0.6 to 0.9% drop in the HbA1c on an SGLT2 inhibitor. So now we've covered quite a lot, right? We now know why SGLT2 inhibitors help you in terms of weight loss, sugar control, quite slight, it's quite modest, but we also know that SGLT2 inhibitors are great in heart failure. So let's talk about that. That seems to be coming more from the natriuresis side, right? That sodium loss. So that helps to cause an improvement in blood pressure. So typically around 3.6 millimeters of mercury. It's not groundbreaking, but it's a little bit of a blood pressure reduction and it helps heart failure. And out of all of these types of heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, preserved ejection fraction, which ones do SGLT2 inhibitors help? And the answer is all three, right? SGLT2 inhibitors have evidence base in all of these domains. So that is how SGLT2 inhibitors actually work. What a glorious moment we are sharing together. And if you are studying for exams, be sure to check out the Reno for the Written program over on our website. You know, no matter where you're studying, even in the really big hospitals, like studying for your exams is really hard. It's really hard. And I think the style of learning when you're doing your exams is people say, right, this is a topic. You just need to know it. And that's kind of how the teaching is. And that's how it's presented to you. But what I think is a a better way for my brain certainly, and I know I'm not alone here, I know that this is true for so many doctor humans that I work with, is it's like taking things from first principles and like working up and not assuming any knowledge on the way there. Because the truth is sometimes we never learn how the body worked exactly. And it's so satisfying to know exactly how things work. It's about building a bridge to the learning, having the learning come across in a way that you wonder why you ever found it hard before. That is our goal. That is our mission inside the Reno for the Written program. So if you want to take the pain out of studying for your exams and just have a place you can go, even after a busy day, watch some learning experiences and really just learn Reno in the most fun way possible, then you're going to love the Reno for the Written program. And I, I'm in there every month. We do some live whiteboard tutorials. It's an absolute blast and I would love to see you there and um, so we can totally hang out. But otherwise, stay tuned here on YouTube. Of course, there's a whole library of videos and you might enjoy this video right here. Thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Humans, and I'll see you again next time. <laughs> Bye.